This lecture has been made available to you courtesy of the American Numismatic Society. Good afternoon. Um, I'll try to get started here. Well, welcome to the 166th anniversary, not anniversary, but 166th, it is an anniversary, annual meeting of the American Numismatic Society. My name is Mike Beal. I'm your chairman and a member of the Board of Trustees, and I'm on two committees, the Mo Committee, Membership and Outreach, and also the Finance Committee. And wearing my membership hat just for a second, I would encourage all of you to uh, spread the word about the ANS. Um, I think it's the best value. It's always been a good value, but with all of our remote access and the long tables, it's a heck of a deal whether you're a collector, dealer, or in the academic world. So please spread the word. Um, Jill will talk a minute about membership later on, but our membership is growing, but there's still a lot of opportunity to grow further. Uh, we have to give a shout to Ken Edlow, who has been your chairman for many years now. Ken and his family continue to be active supporters of the ANS, and Ken remains our assistant secretary, leads our finance committee, is treasurer, and member of the executive committee. So other than that, he's not involved anymore. <laughs> um, Ken, we can't thank you enough for all you've done in the past and your continuing support of the ANS. Um, we have one piece of business here, and that is to approve the minutes of this meeting last year. The fellows should have all gotten a copy of these minutes back in October. And there were also some copies available from Rebecca when you came in. So uh, does anyone have any amendments or proposed changes to those minutes? Seeing none, could I entertain a movement to approve those minutes? So moved. Seconds? Second. All in favor? Aye. All right, we got through that. <laughs> okay, well, this is all good, and I'm going to turn the meeting over now to our president, Uta Wittenberg, doctor. I'm sorry, I need a prescription. The, uh, so thank you all so much. Yes, thank, thank you very much. Though nobody calls me doctor. They only call me Uta, doesn't it? Or UT, actually. <clears throat> so <laughs> welcome all. Um, it's wonderful to see so many of you here in the room and welcome also to everyone online. Um, it is really great to have for this annual meeting so many of you. And as usual at this occasion, um, you will hear from the staff about our very successful year. But let me start my presentation here um, with a very personal note about the staff. Um, as many of you know, um, this was the year in which two women took a well-deserved retirement. Um, and they've dedicated a very significant amount of their working life to the American Numismatic Society. Uh, this is Ashley Kreiter, our Director of Development, and Joanne Isaac, um, with this title of museum administrator, barely captured all this work she did. And as I hired both of them all these years ago and worked so very closely with them, I want to express here my heartfelt thanks to them. Uh, it's hard to say how much it meant to have both of them um, by my side in good and bad times. And I know that I speak on behalf of the Board of Trustees when I wish them both an enjoyable, healthy, and fulfilling years of retirement. Turning for a moment now to the work of the Board of Trustees this year, um, it is without exaggeration when I say that the most pressing issue continues to be the relocation of the society, this lease in which we have here ends in, I believe, September of 2028. That sounds like a long time, but to an institution like the Society, this is soon. We now have a team of architects, a relocation consultant, as well as a number of trustees and staff working on concepts, 
how the ANS can organize its diverse holdings, allows members as well as the public to make use of them in a different setting. Those of you present last year know that we were exploring a relationship with the University of Chicago. And while we're still pursuing this, we have opened up other discussions with a, a number of institutions both outside New York City, but we're also um, looking at possible locations here in New York. All I can tell you at this point is there is no proposal on the table from any institutions. But we hope that by the next annual meeting, this will have changed. But what our discussions with the University of Chicago, which was a multi-year uh, process, what they have shown um, where a specific building was discussed, is that the ANS's highly specialized requirement for book and coin storage, but also the Medallic Art Company holdings um, have is that this is not easily found. So this is something I hear sometimes from people. They say, well, you know, there's all this inexpensive real estate. We read everywhere um, almost daily about the collapse of the um, market for office and so on. It is clear here that for New York, this so-called inexpensive, or perhaps we should call this less expensive real estate, is not exactly what the ANS and these massive holdings that we have would need without truly expensive or sometimes simply impossible alterations. They do, these do not really exist in regular office buildings. And you know we were very lucky to have found this place here, which is a former printing building. So the physicality and location of a space let's say within a university or near a museum or somewhere else, determines therefore what we do and who we want to be in the future. And during the last decades, the ANS has flourished as an academic institution with an emphasis on research and teaching as well as collecting, assisting collectors. But one could imagine something else where the ANS sits in a more urban environment, will focus on teaching, school children and adults about financial literacy, for example, would be more important, or were a museum, a display of medallic art and the, the process of producing something could be shown. There's many possibilities here that we're looking at. But what we do know at the moment with the finances that we have in place is that we cannot be everything to everyone and a specific location will come then with a set of programs and there will be some people who might feel disappointed that something they felt we should do is not there. However, no decision has been taken here and we're very interested in the opinions of members, um, all of you fellows that are particularly engaged in this process. So leave aside here where we would be for a moment let us know what kind of activities you think we as members, you all, would like to see. Because if the ANUS wants to thrive and get stronger, we do need to expand our activities, attract new donors to this field. So please do get in touch with ideas, and uh, several people have, but spread the word. Most importantly, though, this is always an opportunity to thank our donors, our members, for their support over the last year. And you will hear from our executive director that it was an extraordinary year. And some of the donors are here today. And I would like to thank you all um, for doing what you do for the American Numismatic Society. So now let me turn to some of the members that we lost over the last year. We're going to get, yep, here we have. Um, this was a particularly sad year um, for us personally because we lost three trustees, including our um, trustee, Jerry Backrock, who was an acting trustee still. And um, Jerry was 
vice president at one point, he actually joined the council, for those of you remember, before there was a board of trustees, there was a council. He joined that in 1993, and he served with a short three-year break that he assisted he should take because that was good governance. Um, he served um, to his death um, for the ANS in a variety of roles. Um, he's very much missed, and I'd like to also say that we were particularly struck that Jerry, who was a professor at the University of Washington in Seattle, an academic, um, left um, a bequest of $200,000, one of our biggest bequests that we have had in very many <coughs> years in cash. Um, and I have to say I am speechless. I'm still, um, can barely think of him not there. In fact, this picture is him at this very podium and all of you who knew him, um, in particular the staff, knew he, he loved the ANS, and um, we will miss him. Walt Husak, um, a large cent collector who was on our board, um, he will come up um, in Jill's report as well, a wonderful individual who was a trustee. And then Stanley DeForest Scott, someone that I met in my years in the British Museum, and when I came here, joined um, the American Numismatic Society, and who was a involved in real estate and was incredibly helpful, in particular in the move um, to this particular facility as he knew this area very well. When we moved here, this was not exactly a hip area, but he actually, he and um, his wife, in fact his wife still lived practically next door here and he was very helpful, a major donor to the society. So these three individuals are really uh, very much missed, but it shows you know, what kind of amazing place it is that we have members like this, and they will not be forgotten. So now, um, I'd like to just also read out the names of the members that we lost over the last year, and just before reading their names, there are some individuals in there that might not immediately ring a bell, but who in their time were extremely active, um, such as a person as Hans Berkun, for example, who you might not know was a Euro European representative for ANS members and ex very dedicated to the ANS. And um, David Feinstein, who um, left some very nice coins, who was a wonderful individual and volunteered here. One of our Huntington winners, Olivier Picard, and so on. Um, every single one of these people was someone we knew. So let me just read their names. Douglas Baldwin, Hans Berquin, Gary Brestet, Arthur D. Cohn, Thomas Drubert, Jerome Eisenberg, David Feinstein, Robin S. McDowell, Richard J. Nadal, Donald Orth, Olivier Picard, Douglas E. Spangler, Jacob Ulvilva. And now I'd like to turn over to Ken Edlow, as already mentioned, our treasurer, who will give you the treasurer's report. Ken. Thank you, Uda, and welcome everybody to the, the annual meeting. Um, I'm gonna talk about the fiscal year that ended oh, on September 30th, 2023. At the end of the year, our endowment portfolio was valued at $48.4 million. It had increased from $44.4 million on September 30th, 2022. That was an increase of $4 million, but it, do it doesn't accurately reflect how the, the securities themselves did because the 48.4 million is after we took out 2.43 million to pay the operating overhead of the ANS during fiscal year 2023. So in effect, when you just look at the portfolio itself, it increased by about 14.5% uh, during the uh, fiscal 2023, which was substantially in line with, with how its benchmarks 
against which it's compared performed. Uh, in fact, during the year, the S&P index went up 19.6 percent, but bonds went down because the Treasury 10-year Treasury yield jumped from 3.83 to 4.58 percent. At the end of the year, uh, our $48.4 million portfolio, 71 percent of that portfolio was invested in um, equities, private equities, and commodities. About 51 percent of the equities were, are designated U.S., and about 43 percent are non-U.S., if you're interested in that aspect. The other 29 percent of the portfolio is basically invested in U.S. Treasury bills and other high-grade preferred stocks. The a average life of our fixed income portfolio to maturity is, is less than 18 months, so we're playing it very close to the vest. Are there any questions? <laughs> Comments? <laughs> Very well. I'll turn it back to Uda, the next speaker. Hello. I'm David Hendon. I'm, I'm first vice president and chair of the nominating and governance committee. Um, I'm pleased to report that uh, uh, pursuant to our bylaws, four associate members were elected uh, as fellows of the society this morning and one honorary life fellow uh, at the uh, board of trustees. They are Dr. Sarah Cox of New York, Mr. Charles Heck of Buff Bluffton, South Carolina, Dr. Eric Krause of New York, who's right here with us today, and Mr. Thomas Wolf of Sarasota. Are you here? I thought I saw you. No, no. Uh, and Charles Anderson of Florence, Alabama was elected as an honorary life fellow. Uh, congratulations to everyone and uh, we look forward to your continuing participation and support of this society. Uh, we will now proceed with the business of the election of trustees. Uh, fellows of the society are entitled to vote at this meeting and according to the bylaws, 20 fellows present in person or by proxy shall constitute a quorum. All fellows present were asked to sign in. Is there anybody who is a fellow who did not yet sign in with Rebecca? Okay. And if any of you have proxies that you haven't turned in, please give them to Rebecca. Now I need somebody who's not a fellow of the society to volunteer to count the proxies. This was a setup. I asked Peter to do it. Uh, and while the proxies are being counted, let me tell you the names of the following trustee candidates who have been nominated for election or re-election. Um, let me just say that the reason that these are broken into one, two, and three-year terms is, is rather random. Over the years, we got out of sync, so every time there was a graduating class, it was no longer even. There were too many people going out and too few people coming in at certain times, so that's the reason that it's been rebalanced. These are the following candidates for a one-year term ending in 2024. Dr. Sebastian Heath of Brooklyn, Jonathan Kagan of New York, and Uta Wartenberg Kagan of New York. Trustee candidates for a two-year term ending in 2025 is our current trustee, Daniel Hamelberg. And for the three-year term ending in 2026, Carol, Al Carol Ann Menzi Collier of Amsterdam, who is with us today, Beth Deicher of Sylvania, Ohio, who is recovering from surgery, Robert Candell of New York, who was here with us this morning, Alexander Kropf, who is here right there, John Nebel, who is with us today, Robert Rodriguez, who was with us on Zoom, 
uh, Robert Ronis and Chris Salmon. Uh, uh, Robert Ronis of LA and Chris Salmon of Paradise Valley. Would a fellow please second these nominations from the nominating committee? Sure. Thank you. Okay, uh, now it, any fellows who have not mailed or handed in their proxy, please raise your hand in approval of these nominations. They're counting, keep your hands up for a second. You don't have to count on your toes, too. Oh, yeah. just kidding. <laughs> you got a count? Yeah, we do. Okay, thank you. So uh, you have a count of the raised hands, and do we have the proxy count to announce the outcome of the election? I love suspense. Congratulations to the, um, the uh, trustees who have been reelected, and uh, thank you very much. Uh, I, I, I just want to say that uh, the trustees of the ANS work pretty hard. Um, there's a lot to do, and, and it's really interesting that each person sort of works in his or her own area, except for some people who do everything. Uh, and <laughs> But uh, it, it's, 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 it's really an organization that's run by us. And uh, I mean, I, we, I, I wish that I could hire our finance committee to manage my funds. That was, you know, that, <laughs> thank you. And so now uh, Gilles will give his executive <laughs> Good afternoon. Uh, so my name is Gilles Bransbourg, uh, Executive Director of VNS. And um, uh, following our tr uh, several of our trustees' presentation, it's going to be my turn as an employee to complete uh, this uh, afternoon session. OK, so um, something, as you know, uh, with, uh, with the pandemic, there had been a suspension of many of our in-person activities. So now they have resumed um, in uh, their original format. And I'm happy to report that the um, famous Eric P. Newman summer seminar, which last year occurred with uh, students who had, been, who had missed the 2021 and 21 session um, and could still come, um, now we had a full roster of new students, so um, full format. Uh, we could uh, hold as well an Huntington Award ceremony. Um, I'd like to stress as well the coinage of the Americas Conference, COAC. There had been a lapse for maybe 15, 20 years uh, between the 80s, early 90s and um, early 2000s and when it was resurrected a few years ago thanks to Jesse Kraft and thanks to the support of um, one recent trustee, Robert Rodriguez, as well as the Stack family. And it was a huge success here. We had about 70 people, 70 to 80 people, between people in person and online, uh, with a very interesting demonstration of how to strike coins with 18th century, with an 18th century reconstructed uh, coin um, uh, meal. So that's something that took place here in September. Um, otherwise, VNS staff uh, and trustees have been very busy at most of the major coin shows, uh, notably the ANA World Fair of Money. Um, I'd like to stress as well the participation of our president, Uta Wartenberg, and Deputy Director Nathan Elkins to the AIA, the joint AIA SCS. Uh, annual meeting of the Archaeological Institute of, well, I'm repeating myself, to the joint meeting of the AIA and SES, which is a major uh, academic gathering once a year, and an opportunity for VNS to strengthen its, its network and working relationship with the academia at large.
So digital now, um, VNS, as you know, has got uh, digitization in its DNA since uh, the digitization of a collection started in the late 80s, which is very, very early compared to other institutions of knowledge or museums. Um, the long tables every Friday, or almost every Friday, uh, we are now past the 150th of them. I think it's 158, if I'm not, not wrong. So regularly, we're seeing between 40 and 70 people online uh, every Friday, not always the same people. I mean, interests differ, the topics differ, but it's um, a, a major opportunity, very nice opportunity for us to see everyone online uh, with their face on the screen, which is something we didn't do before COVID. So that's uh, um, a major change in the way we, we operate and reach out to, to members. Uh, the different NS websites gather about 400,000 unique users in a normal year, and these numbers are, are growing. Um, there was as well this year the completion of the most recent NEH-funded uh, project, as well as the continuation of a Roman Republican Die project, thanks to the uh, Arete Foundation support, that will um, culminate with a conference at the American Academy in Rome in 2025. I would say that probably the high mark uh, for us of the year has been this um, fantastic development. We had one of the 1794 large cent return to the INS collection after 75 years. So we, you know, we would like to thank all the people who were involved in that process. As, as you know, it's a complex story, and it's um, uh, not always obvious uh, to trace how things happened. But the USAC family realized that the coin in their family one, was one of these uh, um, cap coins that had been stolen from the NS collection decades ago. Uh, it was part of a George Clapp collection of U.S. Uh, large uh, cents, which had been donated in 1946. So I, I won't go back to the entire history, but some of you may, must be familiar. And um, we, want, we would like to thank recent fellow, actually was uh, elected this morning, uh, Chuck Heck, who played a prominent role in engineering this return. So on this uh, picture on the right, uh, Ch uh, Chuck Heck with uh, our U.S. curator, uh, Jesse Kraft. Um, on the top, this is a coin that was returned to VNS. At the bottom, that's the coin we are giving in exchange because our policy is to give back the coin that was exchanged against uh, our coin. So this, this coin is going to be returned. There will be a ceremony at the fun show early, uh, early December in Florida. So another clap, um, I was trying to figure out what was the relationship between these two claps. Some website wrongly states that one was the son of the other. It's absolutely wrong. But from my, from my colleague David Hill, it seems they, are, they were second degree cousins. Um, and um, I know David will make more comments about the acquisition of this uh, uh, fantastic inventory. But um, I'd like to thank another recent fellow um, of the ENS um, who is uh, with us today, Dr. Er er Eric Kraus, who was instrumental with his um, uh, financial help, financial help um, for the ENS to be able to acquire this uh, very rare manuscript. We've had many acquisitions uh, during the year. Um, I think about 28,000 objects of, and 26,000 of these 28,000 are this. So, <laughs> um, I, I know the acquisition was not entirely consensual among the curatorial team, but both Ute Watenberg and myself loved it. Um, these are boxes of cardboards um, which are inscribed with the name of a farm, a landowner, and what they were paid for. We're talking about seasonal worker. And these things have a long history. They post-date the Civil War, um, when the landowners in the South, obviously, you know, were broke, 
and um, they were forced to pay people that used to work for them without being paid, I mean, the slaves. And uh, then these coupons were still used until, I think, the mid-20th century or even later. We have now 26,000 of them, which is probably the largest collection in existence. And it's a very powerful testimony of US social and economic history. Actually, uh, if you know of any graduate student or PhD candidate or, or even undergrad, I mean, someone who would like to do a thesis on something like this, this is a huge work in order to see where this um, little piece of cardboard comes from, what your what geographic location. Uh, if you could have a chronological and geographic map of these 26,000 uh, pieces, that would be extraordinary. So, very interesting acquisition for the collection. As Uta mentioned, we um, have uh, celebrated some departure, departures. They are, they are happy <coughs> departures. Um, to, so, Echel here and Johan, after many, many years here, retired. And from what I can, what I know, happy retirement. When they come here, they, they, they're smiling. Not that they were not, ha they were not happy here, but they, <laughs> they're even ha still happy after VNS. And um, I'd like to pay as well tribute to Austin. Uh, Austin is probably someone that most members uh, knew because he was always over the phone with them. Um, he, he was a very chatty person in a good sense of a term. Now he's a graduate student at Yale, uh, and we extend our congratulations for his um, very successful uh, continu the co continuation of his uh, academic life at Yale University. Fundraising, I'll give some more details later, but in, in very few words, um, we had a very high year with uh, one million and three quarter, so one million seven hundred and fifty thousand uh, dollars raised over the year. Um, most notably, we have more members, but more SAGE members. Uh, I remind you, a SAGE member is someone who gives more than 2,500 in a, in a year. And I believe we had eight new SAGE members. It's a group of 50 plus, so it's a significant increase. Um, and um, we are experiencing an expanding membership base as well as number of donors, which is, I'm being told, uh, some, somehow unusual among uh, non-for-profit uh, <laughs> societies. So this is my own academic research, no need to, to comment. Um, and uh, thank you, uh, but I will speak again, uh, unfortunately, our um, development uh, person, Caitlin, uh, could not make it today. She has a serious family issue, so I will. Um, uh, I'll tr I can't replace her, but I will say what. Try to say what she wanted to say today. Thank you. Good afternoon. Um, is this working? How did you make this advance? Oh, there we go. Okay, so we have uh, seen a number of significant changes in the staff composition this year, as uh, Uta and Gilles have already alluded to. Uh, first, we congratulate Dr. Lucia Carbone on promotion from Assistant Curator to Andrew M. Burnett, Associate Curator of Roman Numismatics, after six years of dutiful service to the Society. And in August, we promoted Emma Pratt to Art Director in view of her ever-growing responsibilities, such as the design and layout of the ANS magazine, which she has managed with great skill and efficiency over the last year. Uh, Longtime curatorial assistant Adya Bedi has recently moved to a full time schedule. Her knowledge of the collection and its organization will be in indispensable as we prepare for the relocation of the ANS. And Ryan Sullivan, who was hired last year as e commerce coordinator, is now a curatorial assistant and has also become full time. He continues to manage the eBay store and will also now be working on processing materials from the purchase of the Medallic Arts Company archives. As you heard, 
Austin Andrews, who is so well known among the, our members, resigned in August uh, to pursue graduate work at Yale University, and we wish him well. Um, in his place uh, for membership, we hired uh, Liberty Serva, Sova as membership coordinator in June to take on his membership responsibilities, and she has already proven herself to be a valuable member of the administrative team. As you also heard, Eschel Kreiter, Director of Development, moved to a part-time remote schedule in June in anticipation of full retirement in December. To benefit from her wealth of knowledge before she departs for good, we hired Caitlin uh, Smith in January as Assistant Director of Membership and Outreach, or sorry, Development and Outreach. Our board is already familiar with Caitlin and she has begun managing membership and development with remarkable skill. And finally, Joanne Isaac, a long-serving member of the ANS staff, fully retired in June, and she graciously allows us to call on her once in a while when her institutional memory is in need. So she's retired, but she takes phone calls. Um, I remain grateful to her for thoroughly teaching me about the behind-the-scenes operations of the ANS that keep the doors open, labor law and regulations and filings and this and that kind of thing. Uh, and our new admin museum administrator, Rebecca Komen Rager, was hired in April and has proven to be a skilled and organized administrator and is an indispensable and key member of our administrative team. Last year, I reported on a number of human resources, employment, and internal policy updates that I took on as a deputy director shortly after I arrived. And now that we're up to date on all of these items and are confident in our regulatory compliance, Rebecca has adeptly taken over the day-to-day -day management of human resources policy and monitoring for updates, uh, which has allowed me to focus more on supporting Gilles as executive director um, and working on more strategic matters facing the society. And of course, one area of strategic importance I'm involved with is uh, publications, where I work closely with our publications director, Andrew Reinhardt. Uh, we, so I'm going to talk to you now about publications. Uh, we continue to publish critical cutting edge research in our peer reviewed flagship journal, the American Journal of Numismatics, and also in uh, the rising and increasingly prominent and re relatively new journal, the Journal of Early American Numismatics. David Hendon's sixth edition of the Guide to Biblical Coins published last year continues to be a bestseller in terms of ANS books and we ordered a second printing this summer and I think it sold out again so more's on the way. Uh, uh, some delays in various projects resulted in only two new bo books published uh, this fiscal year, Numismatic Antiquarianism through Correspondence edited by Francois de Calatay and Scythians and Greeks on the Western Black Sea uh, by Elena Stolyaric and John Kleberg. Much progress has been made on other projects in the next fiscal year. We expect to see a flurry of activity in the first part of the year. The long anticipated coins of the Ptolemaic Empire Part Two by Catherine Lorber is now in press and will ship to buyers uh, near the end of October. And ANS Publications won eight Numismatic Literary Guild Awards in 2023, including the Best Specialized Book Awards in the categories of Tokens and Medals and Numismatic Histories or Personalities, the Best Column or Article on U.S. Paper Money, the James L. Miller Award for Article or Story of the Year, the Best Column or Article on Numismatic History or Personalities, the Best Periodical for a Club or Nonprofit Organization, uh, the best blog, and the best website for a club or nonprofit organization. We congratulate all of the authors whose hard work merited these awards. Fiscal year 2022 saw the, nego that's last fiscal year, saw the negotiation of new distribution partnerships and publication models, which were realized in this fiscal year. Breppel is now printing ANS books and the AJN for distribution outside of the United States, which is resulting in significant savings for both the ANS and its members. Breppel is a major international uh, publisher with a strong marketing presence, which we anticipate will bolster the promotion and sale of ANS books internationally. 
Breppel will be distributing ANS ebooks within the next few months, and we are in discussions about the potential of them printing and distributing the ANS magazine outside of the United States, which would result in more cost savings with regard to international distribution of the magazine. In June, ISD became the new distributor of ANS books in the United States, and ISD too has an aggressive marketing presence in the world of academic books dealing with history, classical studies, and archaeology. There we go. Since the beginning of 2023, all new ANS titles have been printed through Books International, which allows shorter print runs than most printers. This means that large stocks need not be kept on hand and allows for a significant reduction in costs. New runs can easily be in ex executed, and so a book may never go out of print. With a selection of papers and cases available, the ANS can offer books of high production quality with smaller upfront investments. And many academic presses have already moved to this model, such as the University of Michigan Press. Based on research conducted last October and November that I presented to our uh, publications committee, we estimate we will generally reduce print costs by 50 to 75 percent as part of this move, in addition to being released from the burden of keeping large stocks on hand. To illustrate the advantages, I provide the example of the soon-to-be-published coins of the Ptolemaic part, Empire Part II. We're printing 300 copies for sale and distribution in the domestic market at a cost of approximately $11,000, or about $36 a set. Um, on our formal model, we would have needed over to order 500 sets at a cost of $32,000, uh, almost $32,000, uh, or $63 a set, and of course, a shorter print run of about 300 copies on the traditional model would result in even higher uh, per set cost. And I want to give you a, ca a caveat because I know these numbers look low to you uh, as buyers. Um, while these both might seem like relatively low print costs compared to the retail price of the book, bear in mind that the ANS bears other significant costs uh, related to the realization of each book, such as hundreds of hours of staff time, not just the publications director, devoted to the vetting and editing of the manuscript for each book, and contractors to typeset manuscripts. The new print model provides numerous advantages and allows the ANS to continue to make important scholarship available in a high quality printed format. The utility and cost effectiveness of short run printing means that the potential popularity of a title doesn't have to play a significant role in a decision to make important numismatic research available. And finally, you may remember from my report at the last annual meeting that the ANS conducted an internal review of uh, the provenance of Native American affiliated objects in the collection to determine uh, which uh, were subject to provisions of the Native American Graves and uh, Protection and Repatriation Act, NAGPRA, which obliges institutions such as the ANS to identify these objects and uh, to notify and repatriate uh, any objects, any, any objects from graves to any descendants uh, or affiliated tribal bodies. Um, the ANS identified three objects that came from graves and repatriated two of those in the last fiscal year. And in January, we repatriated the third item, which you see here, a Lincoln campaign medal from 1860 that came from a Native American grave in Oregon. To the best of our knowledge, after conducting this rigorous review, we have no more items in the collection subject to NAGPRA regulations. To conclude, I would like to take a brief moment to thank the ANS staff for all of their hard work realizing the mission and vision of the society. It is due to their hard work that the ANS is what it is and offers the numerous benefits that our members enjoy. Gilles, of course, is an excellent manager and works, well, he is. He keeps us on track, uh, um, uh, executes the mission and vision of the board, and of course, the curators make our uh, collection available to researchers and coordinate our diverse educational programming. The librarians keep us current and maintain our resources as an international destination for numismatic research. The publications department disseminates cutting edge uh, research through our periodicals and books. 
and our robust digital programs would not be possible without our IT and media staff. And of course, our membership and development staff foster critical relationships with members, fellows, and donors. Uh, our administrative staff endeavors to keep everything running smoothly, on schedule, and in the bounds of regulatory compliance and board oversight. We operate on a tight budget with a small staff on which there is always high pressure, uh, and yet the staff uh, meets these challenges with cheer most of the time and uh, accomplishes so much. I must say it's a really great team of people to work with. Thank you. So I think it's uh, back to Gilles now for membership and development. Oh, sorry, it's me again. Um, so... Yeah, I'm using the notes and slides that have been prepared um, by Kathleen Smith, our Assistant Director of Development and Outreach. Thank you. So, um, we have gone through, um, as I mentioned a little bit earlier, it's quite a record year, not quite as high as last year, but last year we had a, a massive gift for one of the, one of the chairs, the Roman chair, uh, yet um, we are close to last year um, with more than uh, $1,700,000 in donations and grant, including almost a million in general contribution uh, more than 500 in restricted funds and um, 150,000 from the gala. So for those who are not familiar, uh, restricted funds typically will pay for specific chairs. So we have a fund for the you know, Greek creator, American creator, Roman creator, and so on. And we draw like 5% of these funds to pay for the salaries of their respective um, um, employees who uh, fulfill this mission. Now, the general fund is a multi-purpose uh, bucket of money that we can use for, uh, you know, paying the rent, running, having electricity, and, and so on. Uh, so, as you can see, it's pretty split uh, between both um, uh, both the general and uh, the restricted. Among the um, uh, most significant can donation. Uh, I'd like to highlight the $300,000 we received for the U.S. chair, so the Resolute Americana chair in American Numismatics. It was part of a pledge of Alpha Minion, of which $200,000 were given last year, and now $300,000 to make Alpha Minion. Uh, we received as well $33,000 um, into the chair of Medieval Renaissance and early European numismatics, as well as 6,000 to the Andrew M. Burnett chair in Roman numismatics. And I, I would be expecting more money uh, into the third chair um, the next uh, fiscal year. Um, now, regarding um, all the major gifts, as uh, our president mentioned at the beginning, we are working on a future relocation, and we are running some costs already, uh, paying a consultant uh, for everything which is real estate oriented. Uh, we paying as well an, an architect, uh, because we, there are different scenarios about the type of building or the type of layout we may need, and these entail some cost. So I'd like to thank particularly um, our Vice President, uh, David Andin, who sold part of his collection uh, this year, and that brought to VNS uh, $230,000 that went into that relocation fund. And there was uh, another um, benefactor who is in, in this room as well. Um, we um, uh, received from the Arete Foundation $155,000 which fund the Roman Republican Die project managed by Lucia Carboni. Um, and this was uh, the Oxus Indus project. Um, it's the last tranche of the National Endowment for the Humanities, NEH, um, 
uh, grant we uh, receive for this other part of our digitization program. You remember Ocker, you remember Pella. So we, we've had these um, online projects, uh, mostly handled in curatorial, receive, receiving support from the NEH. Um, the Mountain Foundation uh, provided another gift this year, 75,000, which allowed VNS to repatriate entirely what was still in Wisconsin uh, following the purchase of the Meco archives. We're talking about tons and tons and tons of objects. So they, they were very large trucks uh, to our warehouse in, uh, in Brooklyn. Um, and we're thanking the Mountain Foundation for um, its uh, support. Uh, all the gift uh, materialized, uh, including gift in support of the COAC. That's something I mentioned earlier. So this is our uh, benefactor wall. Um, so to be uh, nailed on that wall, <laughs> your name, <laughs> you need to give half a million. You, I think it used to be a quarter of a million. It was, uh, it was increased to half a million. And at some point, we'll think about increasing it again. So um, take advantage of it <laughs> while it's still so cheap. <laughs> And these are uh, the most recent uh, person who made it into the wall. Um, two of them are in the room uh, right now. And the third one, uh, Rob Rodriguez, was on his way to a breakfast on the beach in California, end quote. So th <laughs> thank you from New York with the uh, with rain. <laughs> uh, plan giving. Um, it's um, a, proje a project uh, very dear uh, to uh, our trustee, uh, Caroline, uh, who has helped um, Eschel and Kathleen to work on different materials that uh, have been um, included in the magazine. There is a specific brochure as well. So the message we're sending here is, um, well, think of the ANS. I mean, we're not in a hurry. We, we're not asking anyone to die soon and quickly. <laughs> but for this very, very, very distant date, think about the ANS. Um, we, um, you know, as a joke, I would say we take everything, credit card, cash, no. But more seriously, um, could be a collection or part of a collection, uh, coins. Um, we've had some very wonderful gift, uh, sometimes from people we, been, we would have no expectation, uh, members we barely know about, and one day uh, 150 Roman coins materialize here from someone who is not particularly wealthy at all. So we, we, we've seen these this kind of decisions, uh, which are very helpful. They help the NS collection grow, and in case we're dealing with duplicates and these objects are sold, it will help VNS to operate, grow, and uh, be part of um, the field of numismatics. Membership, so it's, um, we are growing our numbers. I, I think Kathleen wrote somewhere the actual, uh, uh, mm, I think we have about 1,600 active members. 1,600. 63, like 30 more than last year, uh, more or less. And these are the uh, geographic um, spreads, so mostly the Americas and, uh, and Europe, but uh, um, I wish in future we'll have more, more people from you know, Asia, Africa, uh, more from Latin America as well. And uh, well, I'd like, to, on behalf of Caitlin, who could not make it today, and we hope her grandmother goes well. Um, I would like to thank you on behalf of the entire staff and you know, our trustees, our donors, the SAGE member, uh, fellows. Um, without your support, we would not operate. We, we're not a private corporation. We don't derive um, a lot of income from sales. We print our book at cost, as Nathan explained. Actually, we lose money with books, but it's part of our mission. So your gift um, help us thrive after, you know, since 1858, uh, after quite many years of existence. Thank you so much. <laughs> David. Okay. 
Hello, I'm David Hill. I'm the librarian and archivist here at the ANS. And okay. I want to begin this year by talking about the people other than me in the library who accomplished so much for us. Um, mostly these are volunteers, and they're working towards degrees in library science for the most part. Harriet Williams here was, uh, came to the ANS seven years ago, and she was a library student at the time, and she's still volunteering here. And people like Harriet accomplish the kinds of projects that I just look at for years, and I think these things are never going to get done. And it's really Harriet and others like her that get these projects done, so it's, it's probably one of the more satisfying things uh, for me here. Uh, when we receive boxes of auction catalogs, it's Harriet who finally got them into the database. Uh, when we got a collection of counterfeiting materials, it was Harriet that cataloged them all. Uh, she straightened out our shelves of rare journals and pamphlets, and she's processed centuries-old French documents for us. Um, and as I say, getting these concluded is so satisfying. So I really wanted to just take this opportunity to acknowledge Harriet in particular, who's been here so long for us, um, working as a volunteer. Um, and she's accomplished so much for us over the years. Uh, Jared Goldfarb also got a lot done for us over the years. Several years he was here, but last year he became our uh, assistant librarian and cataloger. Uh, he, Jared's great because he really likes to master the finer points of cataloging, so it's been really great to have him here to help to assist in training our uh, volunteer interns. Um, he really has become quite an expert in cataloging in our online database here at Donum. At the beginning of 2023, we welcomed two new volunteer interns to the library, and both of them are completing degrees in library science. Jennifer Jenkins uh, focused much of her attention on cataloging auction catalogs and articles and rare books. Sitchin uh, Karp did similar work. He was processing, for example, our Mint Decree collection that dates to the 1500s. And after his time as a volunteer here, um, he actually stayed on for the summer to work on an archives project for school credit. So he was here more hours per week. Uh, he was able to complete in that time over 70 collections and items, and his descriptions are now available in our da uh, archives database, Archer. Uh, I've had numerous interns work on these projects also over the years, so it was incredibly satisfying to see these uh, concluded. Okay, so one of the items that St. John catalog uh, sorry, Sitchin cataloged was a major acquisition for the library this year, uh, as we've heard. Uh, this notebook documenting the remarkable collection of United States coins assembled by J.M. Clapp and his son around the start of the 20th century. Its purchase was made possible by Eric Krauss, who we mentioned before, and who we're uh, so um, thankful for uh, being able to um, cover part of the uh, substantial cost of producing or, or of uh, purchasing this. And this uh, notebook, along with some of our other archival um, acquisitions, is available uh, on display over there in the uh, rare book room. So this inventory represents the only catalog of this extraordinary collection, and until now it was in private hands, so we're thrilled that it will now be preserved in the ANS library, accessible to collectors and scholars alike. We will a were able to acquire other rarities at auction this year, including a number of 19th century newspapers and articles on counterfeiting, a nearly complete set of Barney Bluestone fixed price lists, and the first volumes of the rare periodical coin circular published by George Dillingham in the 1870s. Also on display over here is another prized item we added this year, which is this early catalog of a collection of ancient and modern medals formed by Antoine Schelte and offered for sale in Amsterdam in 1700. We also acquired more archival materials like this correspondence and other items pertaining to the early American Coppers Club including uh, letters from club notables like Ted Nafsker, Jack Collins, and Del Bland. From David Fanning, we received over 100 photographs documenting meetings of the U.S. Assay Commission showing mint directors such as Nellie Taylor Ross, Eva Adams, and commission members at work, including Ken Brissett, 
Francis Trees and Chad Krause, uh, who can be seen in the picture that's on display over there, uh, holding his Assay Commission medal. And, of course, we received uh, some correspondence from David Henton, who was until mom uh, momentarily, <laughs> he's no longer over here, right? Okay. Um, gave us some of his personal correspondence relating to Jewish coinage, along with a notebook belonging to Yaakov Mesherer, Mesherer uh, that contains photographs of ancient Judean coins with Mesherer's notes. Another interesting group of materials we got from Bill Bird uh, are these that pertain to a micronation called the Nation of Celestial Space, or uh, Celestia, for short. The curatorial department got examples of the Micronation's coins, while the, li while the library got the documents, which include a passport to the moon, flag designs for Mars and other celestial bodies, and correspondence relating to celestial's coinage. Celestia's coinage. So also those, these items are also on display. Celestia apparently uh, claimed uh, Acts claimed that they owned all of ter uh, all of space except for the um, uh, celestial bodies. Uh, from Ellen Overman, we received a binder of correspondence between her father, Marshall Overman, and Eric Newman, and others concerning some 1699 half pennies that were found during excavations for the I-95 Expressway. Coins confirmed by Newman to be fakes. And from Rosalie Frost, we received a binder of correspondence, photographs, and ephemera of coin dealer Frank Caton, documenting several decades of his life in numismatics. And our archival collections continue to get a lot of use. Our, the photo file, begun in 1915, is still used for provenance research by such visitors as Bill Dalzell of CNG. Whoops. Lindley McAlpin, a fellow at San Antonio Museum of Art. Jordan Montgomery and Scott Roddinghouse, part of a group that come in periodically to research Roman and Republican coins. Denise Allen, curator of, um, at the Metropolitan Museum of Art, did provenance research using a different set of records, our Sultan collection. And we were happy to host Ellen Feingold and Jennifer Glode of the Smithsonian's National Numismatic Collection here to research, uh, here to conduct research using our Vladimir and Elvira Klein Stefanelli papers. This is the second time we've seen Chuck Heck here, and we're always happy when Chuck stops by, and perhaps more than ever this year because he came uh, bearing the stolen clap coin to return to us. And while he was here, he took the opportunity to conduct research in our CLAP correspondence. Our collaboration with the Newman Numismatic Portal continues to thrive. As always, it's technician Lara Jacobs, who is responsible for the day-to-day -day work of getting everything processed and online. And she puts everything in order and handles many thousands of pieces of paper in every catalog page that gets uploaded. Last year, we announced that the correspondence files from the Society's first 50 years had been scanned and uploaded. Now she's gotten through the next big chunk of records covering the, year 19, covering the years 1908 to 1931. Uh, and this fills about 30 large banker boxes. So this is really a lot of work on her part. Another uh, significant group that we added this year was all of, the, all of our Baldwin auction catalogs. Recently, Newman Portal uh, project coordinator Ken Augsburger, or sorry, Len Augsburger, and assistant Kim Dumas were in town to gather issues of numismatic news that were needed for scanning. And this time, while they were here, they helped us and they stayed a couple of extra days and actually cataloged over 100, 100 Stiegelwald, uh, Stiegelwald price lists so that they could be added to the Newman Portal and Internet Archive. Uh, Ryan Sullivan, who was also mentioned earlier, um, sales of duplicate books continued to help fund library <coughs> purchases this year, bringing in over $4,000. And I want to thank Ryan here uh, 
and here he's seen here photographing the materials uh, for putting it on eBay. He works very closely with our collections manager, John Thomason, on these eBay sales. It was my pleasure to contribute articles to the magazine this year, uh, one on our counterfeiting collection, and another on the various medallic artists whose papers can be found in the Smithsonian Archives of American Art online. And as always, I want to thank everyone who has contributed to the library this year. Uh, it's always appreciated. Everybody that contributes every year um, is most welcome. Another list of our contributors. And with that, I would like to turn it over to our chief curator, Peter Van Elf. Thank you, David. Good afternoon, everyone. Get this thing fired up and rolling. Is that a three for three, two, one? Ah, here we go. All right, so the project that began life as Oxus Indus that you've been hearing about ended even bigger. This is the uh, Bactrian and Indo-Greek Rulers Project. Um, this is a joint Oxford University American Numismatic Society project that was funded jointly by the NEH and the UK's Art and Humanities Research Council, and this came to a successful conclusion a little bit earlier this year. Um, on the US side, project co-directors Ethan Gruber and myself then shifted our attentions to the enormous task of building out a new back-end for the ANS's digital collection catalog based on the open source collective access program and migrating the vast amount of data in the catalog over to the new platform. Um, as part of this effort, Ethan, along with the contractor, Sammy Norlin, and of course the curatorial staff have been performing a substantial amount of data cleanup, which has included standardizing terminology and um, eliminating irregularities. I can say that word, I promise. Um, as a result, you'll see a lot more um, better um, data in, in the collection catalog um, online soon. And this is just a little snapshot of about half a million terms that Ethan worked through uh, in the metals section earlier this year. Uh, while this task has proceeded, um, Ethan and I have also continued to play an active role on the scientific committee of nomismod.org, which is a absolutely critical digital resource for a lot of the ANS's online endeavors. Um, some other digital projects that Ethan and I are working on um, now in the works include a comprehensive online resource for monograms and other symbols that appear on Greek coins. And this is something that we're building out with some German colleagues, Ulrika Peter and Karsten Tolle. Uh, we've also now partnered with Chaim Gittler, Chief Curator of Archaeology and Numismatics at the Israel Museum, and Professor Oren Tal of Tel Aviv University, to build a new online resource called Levantine Coinage Online uh, with funding from the Israel Science Foundation. As you've heard from Gilles, the Roman Republican Dye Project, uh, this is jointly led by uh, Lucia Carboni here at the ANS and Professor Liv Yarrow of City University in New York, along with curatorial assistant Al Sharpless, um, have been awarded more funding from the Arate Foundation to continue this project on through 2025. And over the course of this last year, they've uh, added a lot more uh, types and other information to RRDP, um, which also then links to coins of the Roman Republic online. So please do check all that out. Um, as was mentioned a little bit earlier, uh, we undertook a massive move this year. Um, thanks again to the Mountain Foundation. Um, since 2016, uh, Jerry Moran, the owner of Metalcraft in, uh, this is Metalcraft Mint in Green Bay, Wisconsin, very generously stored the thousands of dyes that the ANS acquired as part of its acquisition of the Medallic Art Company's archives. And over the course of several months in late 2022 and early 2023, uh, Jesse Kraft organized and supervised the absolutely grueling, and here I underscore grueling again and again, um, move of 200 pallets of dyes, each of which weighed roughly half a ton, um, in eight tractor trailer trucks to the ANS's warehouse in Brooklyn, um, where they have now joined thousands of dye shells, galvanos, 
and other MAKO items um, that the ANS has acquired. And Jesse now, along with curatorial assistant Ryan Sullivan, who you've seen a little bit earlier, have now been systematically cataloging, photographing, and organizing all of this material. Um, curatorial staff members have also continued their public numismatic service. Um, Ute Wartenberg was elected president of the International Numismatic Council this last year. Jesse Kraut was named the treasurer of the International Committee um, of Money and Banking Museums, ICOMON, and I'm continuing to serve on the Citizens uh, Coinage Advisory Committee with the U.S. Mint. Education. Um, this last summer, as Shield noted, marked the resumption of the ANS's flagship educational program, the Eric P. Newman Summer Graduate Seminar in Numismatics, um, which again had a full roster of students uh, for the first time since 2019. And we also welcome Professor Hussein Kuker from Soleiman Demirel University in Esparta, Turkey, uh, who joined us as the Eric Newman Visiting Fellow and also provided a number of lectures to the students on excavation coin finds. We also would like to thank ANS fellow Dr. Paul Kaiser, uh, who returned as a guest lecturer, as did cur curator emeritus doc Dr. Michael Bates. So thanks again to both of them. And of course, kudos to Alan Roche, as always, for uh, the class photo. And as you can see, it was something of a return to basics this year. <laughs> um, ANS Lyceum continued with its well-received online courses. In the fall of 2022, we offered Iconic Women of the Ancient World, while in the spring we presented Collection Management and Coin Conservation, which explored the problems and solutions that curators and collectors face in assembling, managing, and caring for large collections of coins, and also introduced students to methods of provenance research for coins and basic um, methods of conservation. And both of these courses featured uh, a good number of colleagues of ours from around the U.S. and the world as guest lecturers. And once again, we'd like to thank them as well for their participation in these programs. In addition to teaching in the ANS uh, Summer Seminar and Lyceum, uh, curatorial staff also taught outside of the ANS. In the spring, uh, Lucia Carboni was visiting professor at Sapienza University in Rome, where she taught uh, graduate Vis uh, graduate seminars on Roman numismatics and economies in the Mediterranean world. And in June, uh, both Jesse and Lucia were once again uh, off to Colorado Springs, uh, teaching at the American Numismatic Association's summer seminar, while I again taught a one-year course, sadly online again this year, on archaic and classical Greek coinage for Koch University's Ahmed um, Center in Antalya, Turkey. Uh, so aside from lectures to students, the curatorial staff also presented their research to professional audiences across the globe in Bulgaria, the Dominican Republic, Greece, Italy, and Sweden, and to audiences closer to home in Arizona, California, Florida, New Jersey, Oregon, Pennsylvania, Vermont, and of course New York. Um, and much of this research now um, has appeared in print or soon will. Members of the curatorial staff also participated in overseas archaeological excavations. David Yoon, who you can see right there, has been a co-director um, excavating at, a, at the site of San Vicenzo on the island of Stromboli in Italy, while Lucia Carboni and Alice Sharpless have both participated in various aspects uh, in Columbia University's <laughs> excavations at the Via Adriana um, near Rome. The 2023 COAC, uh, Coinage of the Americas Conference, or COAC, this last month, uh, which was organized by Jesse Kraft, was a tremendous success, I have to say. Over the course of two days, 12 speakers presented papers on 18th and 19th century design and production, which also included this absolutely marvelous uh, demonstration by Eric Goldstein of a replica hand press that gave all of us in attendance the opportunity to produce coins for ourselves. Um, and some of these, of course, are going into the collection, if you'd like to see. Um, the lectures from the conference are now available on our YouTube channel if you happen to miss um, the events either in person or online, so I would certainly encourage you to check those out. And again, we'd like to thank our sponsors for that event, the Resolute Americana Collection and the Stack family for their generous support of this continuing conference series. 
go back. All right. For their many donations to the collection this year, we thank our generous donors um, who are listed here for their additions uh, to the cabinet. And uh, for those of you who are with us here today in the room, I would certainly encourage you to check out the display of some of these items in the display case just right outside in the hall. Um, and I'd like to thank John Thomas Thomasman, our collection manager, for putting that together. And finally, um, I'd also like to thank this year's interns and volunteers, Sonia Subins, um, Beatrice Klieger, Eric Krauss, and the intrepid Scott Miller, um, who all made substantial contributions to the care, study, and maintenance of the collection this year. And also, I'd like to thank Jared uh, Goldfarb, the uh, library assistant, who is spending one day a week over uh, in the curatorial section helping out. And as David noted, this guy has tremendous skills in organizing material. And Adia Betty as well, who has been helping part-time this year, but now will uh, help full-time. So with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention. And I think you for your I believe um, this concludes the presentation. And as always, I, in case there are any questions or comments, um, I invite you. Um, I don't know how it would work with online, but um, we have a microphone here. Is if there's anyone, uh -huh. please. Hi. Should I say anything about myself, or just ask the question? Introduce yourself, maybe. Okay. Yes, so uh, everyone knows you. Are. Sydney Rasnick, uh, ANS member since uh, December of 2019, right before the world uh, went under. Uh, but uh, my question has to do with an area of coins which I'm becoming more interested in. I've done a couple projects for people at the Art and Antique Center, and there happened to be some a number of Iranian pieces, uh, Persian, uh, Sassanid, Parthian. Um, I printed out a couple things online just to teach myself a little bit about uh, how can I teach myself about uh, Sasanian Parthian coins at the AMS? Yes, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Would you? Uh, we have, what a coincidence. Yes. We have a specialist in the room. <laughs> Sorry, what was the question again? Uh, how can I teach myself through the ANS about Sasania and Parthian coins? Uh, uh, well, one of the things these databases are very good at doing is sorting out coins. So you can focus on any kind of area you want on inscriptions, iconography. Uh, control marks, things to do with the process of minting the coins. So that's a good way to start. There's usually very good bibliographic details listed there. Um, is there anything in specifically? Any uh, Mantis. Uh, so I worked on a or working on a project uh, that uses seven of the major collections: the British Museum. Uh, Vienna, Berlin, New York, Tehran, um, and all of those museums, all of their data is online on all their respective databases. Uh, Parthia.com is a website with a lot of resources that our partner Chris Hopkins manages. He's got uh, <coughs> images, bibliographic references, um, anything you can imagine. <coughs> it's a very good website to use, um, and he's very generous with his knowledge as well if you want to contact him. And he manages our project database, uh, which is for the people working on it only, but we're trying to work on making it more public to everyone else. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> it's wonderful to have. Um, and I hope that answers your question, but I think we can point you to other directions in case you wanted more. Um, any other comments? Eric. Just briefly, when um, an object is returned after we have received something back, such as that uh, large scent, the surrendered piece, uh, what record do we retain of it? Is there anything more than a photograph? Um, well, we don't know where the coin came from, and it is not part of the collection. Right, so whatever was left there it was technically not part of the ANS, so we don't call it a deaccession per se. But 
I think we weigh the coin. We, I mean, you know, all the normal records we would have, but we have usually no other knowledge except it was in the in the tray in place of where the stolen large sand was. Usually the same dye variety, but I'm not an expert on this. So what sort of thing were you expecting? Let's put when I when I examined the coin along with the one that Chuck brought back, it was clearly the, a different dye state. Mm -hmm. And so um, one thought, of course, it's not ours, but it, would a 3D scanner uh, be of help to us before relinquishing this in order to retain absolutely as much data as possible on this? This is a question, um, how much data would one would want to retain, but this is true about really any of these coins. Would that also be true for the coins we have online? You know, that's kind of widening up a bigger part. But um, the answer is always the more information you can retain, the better. So, um, you know, you could think of metal analysis and so on. But I don't know whether, uh, is Jesse here? Yes, yeah. maybe Jesse wants to say more on it, being in charge of these coins as a me holding forth here. <laughs> well, I think a good uh, kind of parallel example would be one of the um, uh, Indian peace medals that we repatriated last year. We actually did take a, um, a plaster cast of it. So we do have a kind of a physical representation of it, plus a digital uh, photograph plus all the uh, you know statistical um, metrological uh, analysis of it too. So um, we haven't made any formal curatorial decision if we'll make a plaster cast of this piece, but um, it's not out of the realm of possibility. Or a 3D scan. Coin is still here, so. I hope that answered your question, at least to some extent. But um, we're always open for ideas, you know. The more, the better. But um, I see. Yes. My name is Lawrence Brown. I'm from Brooklyn. And that's really the most important aspect of my credentials. <laughs> so I was wondering whether or not there was going to be a Hollywood story, because I'm always interested in the story behind the story. Because I understand things are sensitive, so I appreciate that. But I think from the standpoint of the public to really appreciate what the ANS does, because uh, it seems to me that would be one of the themes from this Hollywood script. So I was wondering whether or not there had been any thinking. And Gil, you always think about ways to make money. So I'm just wondering <laughs> whether there are ways in which to consider how to, uh, uh, you might say, uh, take further investment, uh, return on the investment of these experiences. Um, if I understand this correctly, you mean what experiences are we referring to? The story that I seem to be hearing, but not the full story about it. The issue about the coins that we were we actually are oh, receiving. You're talking about the large set. Yes, yes, there was large something I'm sorry. Different. Please forgive me. So, um, that is a very interesting question. Um, I think there is definitely much more, and there are some people who are much more knowledgeable about this. This was something that, let's say, when I first came to the American Numismatic Society was a much more controversial issue. Um, there was, in a nutshell, basically what this was, is this material, uh, these, this uh, club large sand collection um, was researched by Dr. Sheldon, who was the leading expert on this material, but in the process of this research in, let's call it the 1960s, um, it appears he, while working on the coins, he has switched coins. And you can see um, what you read often is that it was exactly the same, the same die state, um, took the coin in the ANS collection and put a different coin in there, but that is actually uh, we know that is not necessarily correct. Um, this led eventually to a lawsuit by Ted Nafska against the American Numismatic Society claiming title um, of the stolen coins. Um, in a 10-year lawsuit which I inherited, um, the ANS, and this was in California, won, and um, this is a long story 
related to this. Some of these coins came back, but we're still missing a significant number of these coins, but we do not actively go in legal ways after, let's say, pursuing them. So the policy of the American Numismatic Society has been to offer a voluntary handover in exchange then for this coin. Um, it has not been, um, if I may say that, and it's a shame that um, Chuck Heck, I know he is online. In fact, I see him there, he has his hand raised, and I will um, try and have him speak. Um, it's not always been an easy process, and I maybe, Chuck, if, are you willing to speak? That, that's why that's I was why waving I was... at you. Okay, waving, yeah, well, I, I have this tiny I, thing. I wave at you anyway, but. Yes, yes, I, I know. Might... I might be able to answer those questions, but I'm not sure I really understood them well. And I apologize for that. You know, my hearing isn't um, like it used to be. But the uh, die state of the coin that was stolen and the coin that was switched in, they're quite, they're quite close. close. And uh, I don't recall that there was a major difference. Uh, and the... Um, the point I do want to make, though, is that there are four other Sheldon 24s in the collection. And the uh, the problem with Die State, I don't think is uh, is is um, is uh, the, the, not the problem, but um, I don't think we have a problem with that. I, I believe that there is an example of the Die State uh, that we're giving back to the Husacks. I, there's still one that, in the collection. And. If I understand the other question uh, about Sheldon, listen, he was a terrible person for what he did. And Uda, if you remember years ago when I was up there first looking at the coins, I was really nervous because I was afraid that somebody was gonna say that I switched something out when in fact, I did not realize that the coins were um, uh, somewhat segregated and I, uh, I thought that I know that w several of the coins that were switched in didn't match the die state at all. And Del Bland was the one who uh, noticed that the descriptions on the boxes, you know, the little Clark boxes that the large sense are housed in, the description on the back didn't match the coin at all. And that, and, and when I was reading that, I said, Oh gosh, what have I done? Did I, did I make a mess here? Did I switch some coins? That's where Sheldon's major fault was. He put in coins that were not even close in die state. And, um, but these are hard to figure out unless you're looking for them. I mean, how many people were up there looking at the die states on, on U.S. large sense? I, I might have been the only one in the last, what, maybe 10, 15 years before Del Bland, uh, since Del Bland. It's it's a difficult process, but so I don't think there's any concern that we're giving back a coin that is of a, a different die state. Um, I think we're comfortable with. I, I'm comfortable with it, obviously, but I think the ANS should be comfortable, and so should everybody else. Uh, does that help, or have I gone on too far? No, I think uh, this is enough. extremely extremely helpful. And the one person I should perhaps credit in this from the ANS side who was let's say the sort of person that did not just look at die states is of course John Kleberg, who was the expert witness uh, for the American Numismatic Society and whose knowledge of this is uh, unsurpassed. It is, there is quite a lot written about this. So um, talk about if you want to read it, you can, you can, um, I can put so you to things. Um, I, actually, if I may, um, uh, I think it was in 2018 or so when John Kleberg was awarded the Huntington Award. He gave a talk that night on this whole um, uh, situation, which is essentially the Hollywood story. And I believe that that talk it's is on our YouTube channel. That so um, that, that would be the place to look. That is very true. So um, the online uh, version. So, um, but I see, can, can uh, hang on one second, microphone. Just help me with this. Did you talk about 44 coins are still missing approximately? Okay. Yes. 
am I correct that whoever only has those coins now doesn't have good title, and that pretend a couple of them came into heritage or came into stacks for sale, would they be quick enough to pick up, connect them as the stolen coins easily? This is, you can hear already, um, I, I, this is a question I'm not going to answer because I'm going to get immediately, um, maybe Chuck, you want to say something what we hope people do. Let's put it like right. this. I would stay away from legal discussion here. Well, I, I, I wouldn't discuss anything legal either because I am a terrible lawyer. I think I'm a good CPA, but I'm a horrible lawyer. Uh, <laughs> but at Heritage, you have Mark Borkart. Yes. At uh, uh, Stacks, uh, Bowers, you have, uh, let's see, Kevin Vinton and John Pack. And at uh, Chris McCauley's Early Sense, you have Bob Grellman. Yeah. You have four people that are that in this country that are doing the cataloging, and they are meticulous with die states. And by the way, you also have, when they call in the big gun, John Kralovich, uh, you, you also have him. And I feel a little awkward saying this, but as many of you might know, uh, my book on 1794 die states, uh, of which the ANS does have a copy. Yes. Uh, I make sure you're the first to get it. Uh, <laughs> that book on die states is just for the year 1794. So the information is out there on the die states, and these people, before they catalog them, match them up. I'm asked frequently to verify certain die states for uh, the companies, and um, and I I think of one slipping by. One slipping by would be highly unlikely. Ken, I hope that answers your question fairly well. Can it slip by? I'm sure, but one of us would notice that. I think one of us. But certainly. So I hope that closes the um, ever more difficult discussion for me about large cents. And maybe we should have a long table that <laughs> all the people that large cents, this is, I mean, the, this is always the field. Um, passions run highest in the field of large cents collecting. That's all I can say. <laughs> so um, are, are there any other comments or questions before we can? have some refreshments. Um. <laughs> well, if not, I, I thank everyone online. Um, I, Chuck in particular, thank you for, for coming in and helping and everyone with these questions. Um, thank you for coming. I hope to see um, many or all of you and more also online uh, next year or much sooner um, for one of the upcoming events. You heard about all of them. And, um, you know, we, we hope that the next year will all be um, and perhaps one that helps you all numismatically in a better one. So thank you for all for coming. Bye-bye.